This podcast is part of the Telerik Developer Network. Telerik, a progress company. Hello and welcome to Eat Sleep Code, the official Telerik podcast. I'm your host, Ed Charbonneau, and with me today is Jeremy Lickness. Hi, Ed. And today we're going to be talking about AngularJS. Jeremy, before we get into the Angular discussion, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I am a practice lead at iVision. I lead the app dev practice, and that means I wear several hats. We're a full technology provider. We do everything from the data center through applications. And in my role, I'm involved with pre-sales with customers, architecting solutions, managing solutions, and fortunately, because I love programming, hands-on development and, and delivery. So I've been doing professional development for 20 years and have really been programming since I was seven years old. So it's a, been a lifetime passion of mine. I'm a six-year Microsoft MVP and have focused on web-based applications for 15 of those 20 years. Most of the applications that I have experience with are web-based and delivering corporate solutions, if you will, through the web. And that is the short and long of it. I do a lot of uh, speaking and, and writing and, and have a pretty strong online presence because I'm passionate about it, like to stay involved with the community. Well, I appreciate you being on the show. And I invited you here because I know you have a lot of experience with AngularJS. And uh, I wanted to talk about Angular today. So why don't you give uh, folks a little bit of background on Angular if they don't quite know what Angular is or, or haven't touched it yet? Sure. that's a, And I like to take two approaches because for those who are more familiar with desktop apps or even the uh, sort of desktop for the web that was Silverlight, so you can think of, of Angular as almost a, a type of Silverlight or WPF paradigm for the web. And I'll explain that for those who aren't as familiar. What it enables is a class of application we call single page application. And in a nutshell, it's a way of providing an experience through the browser that is similar to a desktop experience. You're not uh, following a page paradigm where you're navigating to different pages and waiting for it to refresh. You're truly wanting to interact with the site and have the site update the relevant areas on their own. So what Angular provides out of the box is a set of tools and services. Probably the key piece that the, the web does not have natively is the concept of data binding. So being able to take a template that represents a snippet of HTML and map that to an object in, in JavaScript that, that represents data and have that binding take effect so that you can render something for the customer. So it has that data binding and templating aspect, but it also provides a set of services for building modular applications so you can take components, you can piece those components together and manage dependencies between components, and then out of the box it makes it easier to do things like request data over web services, like uh, manage certain aspects of the page. And what's really distinctive as well about the way Angular is architected is it was built with testing from the ground up. So it makes it very easy and approachable to write applications that have client-side testing in mind and it's focused on the client side. It's a JavaScript library that layers on top of that and facilitates all these different features and, and uh, components, if you will, to build these single page applications. So you said single page applications there. Is this something that's targeted primarily at single page application developers or who, who's the target audience? Who would be the person that would most likely use Angular? So I would say anyone trying to provide a quality experience over the web is probably a candidate for single page. And the reason I say that is because single page applications allow you to optimize the the performance of your application and, and we've been doing this for years so 10 15 years ago it was ajax and and we were making manual calls and then you know we had jquery to normalize the web and and formalize those calls but really the idea 
is even though users are used to this paradigm of having pages that they can bookmark and navigate to, and you don't lose that, by the way, with Angular, it provides a way to preserve that, you're being responsive. So if you have a grid on a page that has a dozen different areas and elements, and someone changes the page, instead of having to re-render that entire page, it's much more efficient to send up the data that represents that next page. And so a single page application provides that experience. So I would say if someone's providing a content site that is more about reading articles and uh, navigating through content that they're going to look at, pictures or, or other types of content, it may or may not make sense in, in that scenario. But definitely if the experience is more of an application experience, so there's someone who's navigating, they're moving dials, they're, they're switching, flipping buttons on and off, entering information, and then some sort of logic's being processed or data is being queried and, and presented. This is a very efficient and effective way to do that. So as most things with software development, choose the right tool for the job. That is correct. Uh, definitely right tool for the job. And, and, you know, part of that, too, is, uh, you know, there's people who have uh, more experience with building webs on the server side. And I would say if that experience is acceptable and, uh, you know, the team has that, that knowledge set, then that may be the way to go. But certainly for people who are looking for that richer client-driven experience, and there's some other parameters around it, too, to, to factor in, such as how much traffic's coming over the network and how many users are accessing the site, because the way single-page applications work is they shift some of the load of, of rendering, if you're doing client-side rendering, to the, the browser, which, in essence, distributes the workload more effectively as opposed to having that server itself be responsible for the rendering. Now, I, I know you have quite a bit of uh, background with Angular. Um, I think you've used it for quite a while uh, from what I know about you. Um, are there any product projects that you've worked on in the past that you know serve as great examples um, or something where Angular is, is really you know shined and, and made that project successful that you could talk about? Sure. I, I have a couple examples. I would say almost every project, that's why I've, I've stuck with it. it. It's not that we... Um, uh, so let me back up. The first project I worked on, which was several years ago, Angular came into the picture because of a proof of concept. So we started building this uh, application. It was a very large application. We had a team of eight developers that later grew into over 20 developers worldwide. It lasted several years. So this was a large project and we started down a path using a uh, different set of technologies. We were using JavaScript and we were sort of building out a framework ourselves, looking at some technologies like Backbone and, and Knockout. And about six months into the project, we decided to take a step back and look at ways that we can improve our efficiency. And one of those ways was looking at other frameworks that may accelerate development. And so we did a spike with Angular and rewrote some of the functionality and found that it was so much faster and more efficient for us to build with Angular. We decided to make the shift. And by the team's estimate, and I have to add that we did also introduce TypeScript, which could be the subject of a different talk. I don't want to muddy the waters, but it did help us with some of the challenges with JavaScript and interfacing and typing. But the combination of those two, the team really believes, helped us accelerate about four times over what we were producing before, which was pretty wow. substantial. And I guess what we really liked about it, too, is I know I've heard you know, some people say that it's a complex framework, but we really had to scale to offshore teams and and, um, you know, those offshore teams had both senior developers. They also had junior developers onshore and offshore. And we had to scale across all of those members. And the fact that we were successfully able to engage those team members, coordinate globally, and still deliver in a faster fashion is, is really what sold me on it. So you could say we spiked it, we looked at it, and the results spoke for themselves. So that that's one example, but then I, I just have so many examples beyond that project, so we were able to successfully launch that. We've had other projects that uh, you know required some rapid prototyping, so getting basically a prototype out to the customer that they could interact with, 
and the component aspect of Angular, the fact that I have this clean separation of concerns, made it incredibly easy for us to have mock data and then turn that into a real project later. And then one of the most recent projects I've been working on is a real-time project that involves the Internet of Things. And so we're with a company that provides a service that connects smart devices with uh, some front-end applications and we're a sort of middleware piece if you will that monitors these packets normalizes them and then provides the ability to see real-time statistics that have to do with uh, activity of devices across networks as well as packet traces and angular provided a phenomenal framework for us not only to be able to stand this up and provide the, the service to the customer but also to take that and integrate that with an existing web application they had and, and anyone who's had to integrate applications from two different teams knows the challenges well the fact that that team had an angular app and we had an angular app made for a very seamless integration so that was pretty exciting I should add to that initial project I was talking about we started on the beta of Angular. We also started on the beta of Kindo UI. And one of the reasons we chose Angular and Kindo UI was because they both focused on HTML5 and JavaScript out of the box. And even though we didn't have the Angular directives yet for Kindo UI or the extensions basically that integrate with it, we were able to build those ourselves and, and plug together a, a pretty rich website quickly with that. Now, uh, Kendo UI is one of the uh, Telerik products. It's a uh, HTML, uh, CSS, and JavaScript-based uh, set of UI components. So it spans from you know your drop-down box to charts and uh, grids and things like that. Um, what what type of applications were you building with it? So this particular application, and and I have to speak. Uh, I can speak more specifically on the recent one, but the initial one involved uh, accumulating large amount of data. You can think of it as survey data, but it, it's not typical, you know, yes, no answers. If you think about people within organizations who can be coded into certain uh, demographic areas, pay scales, maybe they have a title that's part of a hierarchy within the organization, maybe they're part of a geographical hierarchy. So there's multiple paths to get to the, the user and then there's multiple data points. And so we had to build basically a, a set of uh, workflows that enabled users to explore the data and that involved some pretty massive grids. It could be multi-million row grids, which we all know the solution is not to load those into the browser all at once, but we had to provide an experience that felt like you had access to this hierarchical data. So we made heavy use of the grid component from Kendo UI, and specifically because it was so easy for us, and I know nothing's easy in software, but compared to some of the other controls we had looked at, it was very straightforward for us to customize that control to connect it with the Angular directives and, and components that we had and create this experience that was navigating this hierarchical grid. And then once you drill down, there would be different widgets and, and graphics to show. So, so we relied heavily on it for that. The most recent projects, uh, there's just a number of, of sliders and dials and calendar pickers and and pieces that just make the development experience so much easier. I mean, with the, the Kindo grid, we're able to take a data set, bind it, set a few parameters, and have a fully functional, sortable, uh, you know, groupable grid in, in a few lines of code, which is always uh, exciting to be able to get that in front of the customer quickly. Yeah, what's nice about the combination of the two is uh, with Angular and Kendo, you have, you know, all of these controls at your disposal and they all use the same um, domain specific language uh, you don't have to you know use different con uh, control suites together and try to uh, you know work with uh, a grid from manufacturer A and uh, you know chart controls from some open source library you know you've got one common uh, language or API across all of those components and they all tie into Angular 
It, it, they do, and with the recent announcements, the fact that the majority of the controls, the grid control I, I referred to as part of the licensed product, but that's just uh, one control out of dozens that are now open source. So literally, in an open source project, you can pull down these controls and they're Angular ready out of the box, which makes it easy to stand up and experience very quickly. So you've been working with Angular from pretty much day one then, and you've kind of adopted that. It's your default go-to uh, front-end language. It, it is, and I'm, I'm definitely not, I try not to get into the, the politics of one framework is better than the other. So for example, if I have a customer that's on an existing framework, let's say they know Ember.js or Backbone or Knockout, and there's a number of frameworks. We're, we're not, uh, you know, a, a consulting firm that's going to say, hey, we need to, to shift to, to this. We like to work with what works for them and make sure their team's able to scale. But when it's a net new project, that is definitely where our core expertise lies. I have a lot of customers who specifically ask for Angular on the project, and we know from experience that we're able to estimate a project that will get results in front of the customer rapidly with a very responsive, fast user experience using that. So that's definitely our, our preference out of the box is, is to go that way because it scales on two sides. One is on the customer side as far as using and interacting with the application. It provides a great experience. But more importantly on the development side, we're able to establish standards and reusable controls that make it easier to scale across a team. So if a team member tackles a challenge where they have to build a, a certain type of widget, they're able to encapsulate that widget even if that widget itself contains, for example, a Kendo UI control. So I might have a, a save cancel control. So I'm trying to create the metaphor of, of every form has a standardized way of saving or canceling that can turn into a single component that literally you just type an attribute into a cell in your or into an element on your HTML markup and suddenly you have that full capability and functionality and it's reusable across the team so that's very powerful it sounds extremely powerful and you know you're talking about you know building this kind of suite of reusable components um, that kind of brings up a kind of a sore point that I've seen on on Twitter you know I don't have the experience to speak from uh, in regards to all this so maybe you could give us a little insight of uh, what's the what's all the drama between angular 1 and versus angular 2.0 that is a, a type of drama that exists with, with most frameworks. So, I mean, ideally, as, as developers, we'd love to write one code base and have that code base live forever and not have to have major changes or, or migration. So there's paradigm shifts when a classic ASP shifted to ASP.NET. Uh, you know, that was, was not as, as straightforward as some people would like, but it was a necessary jump to take advantage of the new features. But I, I like to compare it with, um, and I know this is almost like rubbing salt on wounds for some people, but I really think this is a, a good analogy. And, and I know that there's active Silverlight projects and developers, but when there is a transition from people asking for Silverlight projects to people asking for more web-based projects, what we found is the Silverlight projects that were approached with some sound development principles in mind, and that's a clean separation of concerns, testability, modularity. Yes, we had to rewrite the UI portions of those, but it was a less painful rewrite because most of the business logic and most of the data services and the elements that it would interact with, we could reuse. We had existing web service endpoints. We had existing logic. The applications that were written as monolithic applications that were hard-coded across the board, those had to be completely rewritten and those were more painful. With Angular, you know, the team made a conscious decision and, and I understand why they made this decision. Angular 1 came out before HTML5 and ECMAScript 6, the next version of JavaScript, had fully evolved and so it, for compatibility, relied on existing JavaScript conventions. There are a lot of features in the next version of browsers and JavaScript and 
and uh, as HTML5 specifications evolve that really solve a lot of problems and you know when you're building software you can reinvent the wheel yourself or if the problems already solved it makes sense to tap into that so if there's a paradigm in the browser that works across all browsers that support the newer version so the decision by the angular team was to go with the newer browsers to stop support for the the older more legacy technologies if you will and that decision uh, is compounded by the fact that it means some of the code is not going to be directly portable or, or shippable and there's some internal changes too so I don't want to give the illusion it's all just about using native and built-in features but I think the team made a conscious decision to take lessons learned to realize that the code base for Angular is I believe it's something like six or seven years old I started using it I believe around 2010 time frame but it had been out in internal form even before that and so the decision was made you know there's a lot of lessons learned we're gonna provide the best experience possible by moving to a, a new library that breaks compatibility there's not going to be a direct migration path now having said that however and this is what caused a lot of angst and there's a lot of people I'm holding off etc but I get back to the way we build angular applications if you look at our JavaScript code base you'll see 80 percent of that code base is JavaScript and 20 percent is angular and what I mean by that is it's all part of the angular application but when we're writing logic, when we're writing models that are encapsulating data, exposing information, talking to services, all of those are written as, as JavaScript objects. And then we use Angular to take advantage of some of the services, for example, that fetch the data, and for the dependency injection aspects so that we can uh, basically reference components and dependencies and have Angular resolve those. And the advantage to that approach is that when we go from Angular 1 to Angular 2 that 80 percent is really not going to have to be rewritten we're going to just focus on the 20 percent and look at the new conventions and paradigms that that Angular uses so I would say that you know it's a very valid concern that the API is going to change significantly but there are things people can do today and practices that that they can follow that will make it easier to make that shift and and fortunately uh, you know, it was a surprise for a lot of people after Silverlight 5 that a new version wasn't coming. Here's an example where we know well ahead of time, and so teams are able to prepare for it. So I do think it's, you know, being aware of it and then taking the right approach. And, and I blog a lot about best practices because there's ways you can write Angular that will make it difficult to migrate, and there's ways you can write Angular that will minimize that, that difficulty. And I think it's important for people to understand that and then I think the the pain points and the fear will be greatly reduced. So is it safe to say that uh, if you have a more clear separation of concerns with uh, the way your codes are written then that's going to be something that's easy, more easily migrated forward? Uh, I, I, it is safe to say that and I've seen that time and time again. I've, I've had that critique that you know Jeremy why are you writing this interface why are you separating these it would be faster and easier to do it this way and, and quite frankly if it's a, a day versus two weeks I'm not gonna hold on to that if, if there's a, a heavy delivery but if it's really just a matter of you know I'm writing the same code but I'm, I'm doing it in the right places and, and separating it I found time and time again that decoupling that you know single responsibility following the principles of, of making simple easy to test easy to use components that string together always makes it easier to migrate upgrade update maintain the software so while while we're on the subject of separation of concerns uh, one of the things I see when I look at angular a lot is um, you know there's ng tags throughout the HTML and there's there's some logic uh, somewhat in the HTML um, what's the concern there or should there be any uh, is there any advice that you have for uh, making that as uh, palatable as possible sure so I, I mean I think everything has a continuum so one of the advantages I believe of, of Angular is the fact that you can use those tags or directives so you can basically their slogan is they teach HTML new tricks and I can basically create new HTML tags or attributes and use those to define functionality now I think you know what I would 
well, I know what I would call that is is a declarative approach, and I believe that's very powerful because if you think about it, if you want to hide or show a div based on a certain condition, and you're turning that over to a design team, and you're saying basically, here's my JavaScript object model, make this web service call based on the data you get back, navigate to this uh, property on the object graph, and then if it's set to this value, then apply this class to, to hide the div. That's one approach. The other approach is to encapsulate that in a directive and tell the designer any div that hides based on this condition just put ng-my-tag and if you add that attribute it's going to hide that and that is very powerful when you have that separation where it's easy to compose your UI based on a predefined set of elements. I think where it gets dicey is you'll see things like the ng repeat element has some logic in it so it's iterating over a list so it does feel more like code it feels more like what we would use in razor syntax on the MVC side so that that certainly adds some complexity but I do think that well-written angular code ends up with very clean templates and that you're not seeing a lot of actual code you know my guidance is if you have a simple expression that you're using to hide a div that's fine use a, an ng expression if it's a complex expression write that code in a testable way on your JavaScript and then expose it as a simple property and so then you're you're minimizing the amount of of logic that's embedded in your template in your HTML which should really be mostly about declarative code and those declarations should be easy to read I know a P is a paragraph and H1 is a header and an ng hide when uh, status is closed is going to make that div disappear if the status is closed. So striving for best practices kind of solves that problem. Uh, with that said, you know, how do, how do you get to know the best practices? How, how do you even get started with Angular in general? What, what are some good uh, resources maybe that people could look at uh, to get going on this? So Angular's own site, angular.org, is, is a great place to, to get started. I see a lot of complaints online that, that allude to the, the lack of, of documentation, and that's evolving. But there is a Learn tab on their site that links out to videos, tutorials, and a plethora of information. So that, that's one place to get, get started. I don't have the, the URL. I can provide it. There's a, a guide of best practices published, and I normally don't like to narrow it down to one person, but John Papa has put together a specific guide of best practices that I think most people in the Angular community agree are really good practices to follow. In fact, I haven't written a guide like that because I felt like he covered most of it. And then my own blog that's at it, it's easy to get to. It's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash coder blog, C-O-D-E-R-B-L-O-G. But that blog, if you search for post tagged Angular, I wouldn't call it a 101. It's not a, a getting started blog, but it's a lot of tips and best practices based on my hands-on experience. So everything I write about on that blog is based on real wor world projects, usually scaled across larger teams and larger problems. So I think there's a lot of information there that I've endeavored to look at, not just, hey, this is neat, or this is a way to use Angular, but this is a way we found makes it easier to maintain, to understand, and to scale on a team. So we'll we'll put together some show notes, um, and we'll link to uh, those resources, your blog, uh, John Papa's content, um, also Kendo UI, and uh, you can find those at uh, developer.telerik.com. Um, Jeremy, where where can we follow you on Twitter? So it's a, a very creative Twitter handle I've I've picked out. It's at Jeremy Lickness. So, and I'm going to uh, a lot of people aren't aren't sure how to pronounce my last name, but it's J E R E M Y L I K N E S S. Jeremy Lickness, and that is a a feed that I uh, share has a high signal to noise ratio. In other words, I I don't tweet about hey this is where I went to eat today or or this is what I'm doing. I, I focus on 
uh, topics related to modern web applications. There's a lot of Angular content that I link to, a lot of Telerik content because I use Telerik in a, a lot of my projects, and a lot of content related to cloud and, and app dev. So that's uh, where you can follow me at Jeremy Lickness. Sorry, Jeremy, but it's a requirement for you to tweet hamburger pictures for me to follow you. So, <laughs> so that's one less follower. <laughs> I'll have to make up for it elsewhere. <laughs> I really appreciate you doing the show with me today. It's uh, great to talk to somebody who's got uh, a wealth of experience in Angular and sharing it with the community. I appreciate you being on the show. Well, thank you. It's definitely my pleasure, and I'm, I'm happy to share those experiences and excited to see where development's going. I think it's a very exciting time for everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim.